as we begin our series, Who is Jesus? Because we really want to equip you guys on how to speak to unbelievers or people that God has placed in your path. We want you to know how to describe Jesus, how to talk about him in a truthful way. What does God's word say about Jesus, who he is and the work that he's accomplished? And so we're doing this Who is Jesus series, but Randy um, taught us out of John 1, verses 1 through 5, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and um, he was the light that enlightens everyone. He was coming into the world, uh, and, and it really looks at Jesus as the logos, which in Greek is kind of the, the creative force, the power that orders everything in the universe. And what John is doing in the first few verses is telling us that Jesus is God. And that's what John tells us in that introduction. Um, so we're going to be continuing in John chapter 1, but John is such an incredible book, and all the books of the Bible are amazing uh, because they all teach us about God. It's what God wanted us to know about himself. Um, but we have spent, in my young adult, in the young adult house church on Thursday nights, we just finished a few weeks ago a 15-month study in John. And Jamarco and Angel, you guys were day one people. You guys were there from day one. I pretty much had to prepare like 60 some odd sermons um, and they were discussion based and sometimes we would, well, a lot of times we'd go over our time. Um, it was supposed to be like an hour of discussion but usually like an hour and a half uh, because I just get excited. And, um, but it was wonderful. I know it was encouraging and edifying for those who, who attended because we got to look deep into John verse by verse, passage by passage, section by section. Um, but for me, having to prepare all of those things just was so sanctifying, so edifying that I was in the word every single week preparing these things, digging deep, um, and so it was a wonderful journey. We're starting Hebrews this week, um, and we're going to be in John and Hebrews this morning. So um, John chapter 1, uh, E.W. Bullinger, who wrote a commentary on John in the 19th century, he was ending his commentary, and he is giving a salutation in kind of the perspective of John and what John had just written. And so he writes this at the end of his commentary. He says, reader, I have now set before you your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, begotten by the Father, eternal, ineffable, co-equal with the Father in all things. He was incarnate for us. He suffered. He died. He rose again from the dead, and he was made King and Lord of all things. He is the fullness of all grace and truth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the ladder and door of heaven. He is the bronze serpent lifted up to render the poison of sin harmless. He is the water which refreshes the thirsty. He is the bread of life, the light of the world. He is the redeemer of God's children. He is the shepherd and the door of the sheep. He is the resurrection and the life, the conqueror of the prince of this world. He is the way, the truth, the life, the true vine. And finally, he is the redemption, salvation, satisfaction, and righteousness of all the faithful in all the world throughout all ages. That is the gospel of John. That is the Jesus that John presents to us in his gospel. So if you'll open John chapter one, starting at verse six, read along with me. I'm gonna touch on John the Baptist real quick. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. This John who was sent from God is John the Baptist, John the Gospel writer is careful to make distinction between himself and John the Baptist. And by John the Baptist's own admission, he is not the light, but he came, sent by God, to point others to the light, and John the Baptist fulfills prophecy. Skip down to verse 19 here. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. And it's, it's imperative to understand that the religious leaders were looking for Elijah. They were looking for the prophet. And so that's why they asked him, are you these people? But they said, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. So what do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, Elijah, or the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. 
These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. In verse 29, this is our main verse for the day. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. There John the Baptist recognizes the eternality of Christ. He ranks before me. John the Baptist was physically older than Jesus by about uh, six months. And, uh, but he says, Jesus was before me. Verse 31, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. So before we dive into Jesus' identity as the Lamb of God, we want to quickly look at John the Baptist and who he is and who he was. He was a preacher in the wilderness. Um, today, he would have been an outcast because uh, he dressed in garments of hair and he ate locusts and honey and he probably stank and nobody wanted to hang out with him. But he was a preacher and he was sent by God and he fulfills, in his own words, he fulfills Isaiah chapter 40, one crying out in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. And he fulfills Malachi chapter three, one who is sent before the Lord, before the Lord suddenly comes to his temple. And his message was one of repentance. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is repentance? Why do we have to talk about it? A repentance is a turning away from sin and is a turning toward God. It's the simplest way to put it. It is forsaking unrighteousness and turning toward godliness. Paul Helm in the Baker, uh, Baker in Encyclopedia of the Bible, he says, repentance always accompanies saving faith in Christ. You cannot have Christ as Savior and Lord if you do not repent of your sins. Because what is he saving you from if you don't repent of your sins? If you don't recognize that you have sin, what is he doing? We must repent of our sins. It is inconsistent and unintelligible to suppose that anyone might exercise faith in Christ as, designed, uh, as divine savior from sin who is not aware and repentant of his own sin. And this is the message of John the Baptist. But why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was this man, the preacher of repentance, the one sent before the Lord to prepare his way, who says of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, Lamb of God is only used twice in the New Testament, this, this one phrase, used twice in the New Testament, both by John the Baptist in John chapter one. But what did John have in mind with this phrase? And since all of scripture is God breathed, what does God have in mind in describing his own son as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Now, first, it's important to know, and if, you are, if you're in the Thursday night young adult house church or if you are in the... Um, Sunday morning, how to read and understand your Bible. You guys have hear this a lot. Um, the entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. Matt Chandler, who was a, um, he was invited to preach, and I showed you guys this clip. Matt Chandler was invited to preach at a church that, and this is a, a new expression that narcissists scripture, and what that means is they make every single passage about themselves, narcissists. And he was invited to preach, and he opened his sermon this way. He said, I love you enough to tell you this. The Bible's not about you. The Bible is about Jesus Christ. And the reason I say that is because we have to go back to the Old Testament to get the imagery of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But Alistair Begg, he has this wonderful synthesizing phrase to describe the Bible and how it's all about Jesus. In the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is predicted. In the Gospels, he's revealed. In Acts, he is preached. In the letters, he is, expect, or he is explained. And in Revelation, he is expected. The entire Bible is about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. That's Jesus. That's the good news being preached in Genesis 3.15. When we read the Bible, we should always ask the question, what does this text tell me about Jesus Christ? That is the first question that we should always ask. Too often we come to the Bible saying, what can I get out of this for me? When in reality, what we should be asking is, what does this tell me about Jesus 
or how am I to live in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ? And John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what's the significance of the title? What's the significance of this description? Well, because he takes away sin, we should probably talk about sin. What is sin? In the Hebrew and the Greek, the base words for sin, both of them mean to miss the mark. Now, if for our culture, we don't understand the depth and significance of missing the mark. If I'm an archer, right, and I'm in a, a competition and I miss the bullseye, but I miss it by one ring, all that happens is I lose a point. But if we miss our mark to be holy and righteous as God demands, the penalty is not a lost point. The penalty is death. So we have to dive deeper. What is sin? Just saying we miss the mark does not do justice to the understanding and the outworking of sin. R.E.O. White in the Baker Encyclopedia, he says, God is holy. In order to understand sin, we must understand God and must talk about God. God is holy, he is righteous, and he is utterly good. God sets the ideal, he sets the standard for human behavior. So if we miss the mark, we're missing his standard of perfection. As lawgiver, God sets the limits to man's behavior and to man's freedom. So sin, if God sets the limits as lawgiver, sin is a transgression. It's an overstepping of where God has allowed us to live. It is rebellion. It is trespassing upon, upon God's kingly prerogative. It is incurring guilt because it is sin against the lawgiver. It is sin against the king. Sin is also described as iniquity, which in the Hebrew means perverseness, a perversion of what is right. In the Greek, it means lawlessness, breaking laws, living however we want. It is rejecting divine rule. It means unruly, that I am living not in accord with how I've been designed to live. Hosea describes sin as adultery, as the people of God joining themselves as husband and wife to idols and false gods. Sin is adultery against God. God, because he is holy, is outraged by sin. He by no means can overlook sin, because if he overlooks sin, it doesn't do justice to his justice, because he always does what's right. And any judge who does what's right will punish an evildoer. Sin is a desecration of God's holiness, is an abomination. It is unrighteousness. Sin is also withholding due reverence to God, withholding what he is rightfully owed, which is worship. It is sin to not worship God. In Matthew chapter six, when Jesus, teaching his disciples how to pray, he speaks of sin as a debt. We say this in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Sin is incurring something against God that we must pay back somehow. But sin is also not just merely a religious notion, right? I remember when I was not a believer and I would hear people talk about sin. I'm like, well, that's just for you. I don't follow God. I don't need to subscribe to your idea of sin and human behavior. But God, in his word, Paul explains it in Romans chapter three. He says, we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. In the Old Testament, God divided humanity into two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. That's it. And so what Paul is saying here is we've already charged that all, both Jew and Greek, who Greek can also be translated Gentile. When we charge that all are under sin, he says the entire world is under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is the description of humanity in God's word. How often do we hear that, oh, somebody, so-and-so is searching for God, they just don't know where to find him. No one seeks for God. No one. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. Now, all the way back in the garden, we see the price of sin. 
God, he had put Adam and Eve in the perfect garden with the perfect trees, with the perfect vegetation, with the perfect animals, in a perfect relationship with himself. He said, but you just can't do this, just this one thing. Just don't eat the fruit of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of it, you shall die. We see the price of sin in the garden. The day you eat of it, you shall die. Now today, there, there's a false notion, and I think Daniel had mentioned this in our content meeting, there's this false notion that if God has cleansed me of my sin, therefore nothing bad will ever happen to me. Listen, God still lets you feel the temporal effects of your sin even though you've been forgiven in eternity. Drunkenness is a sin. I used to drink. Coming up on seven years sober. <laughs> I got a DUI when I was not a believer. Became a believer before my sentencing for the DUI. Just because God had cleansed me of that sin, he had taken the taste of alcohol out of my mouth, doesn't mean I still didn't have to pay the $10,000 for court fees and lawyers, have my license suspended. Temporal effects of sin, they're still there, but I'm forgiven. He's cleansed me. Sin requires the payment of death. Sin, because it is against the holiness of God, it defiles anything and anyone it touches. And the only way to be rid of sin is to die. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What we have earned with our sin is a death sentence from God. Even in the garden, when Eve was deceived because she believed the evil one over God and she gave the forbidden fruit to her husband, that's a sin, but also Adam sinned for taking it, no one can cause another person to sin. After they fell into sin, they tried to cover their own shame and guilt with leaves. But God had something better in mind. He clothed them with an animal skin. Now, for any hunters in here, how do you make an animal skin? You have to kill an animal. The wages of sin is death. God killed an animal to clothe his children in something better, to cover their, sh uh, to cover their shame, to cover their guilt. Fast forward in the biblical story. God's people have been slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and God is gonna rescue them. And God is executing judgment upon Pharaoh and all of his people, the Egyptians. And he's executed nine plagues, and a tenth is to come. And the tenth is that the angel of death would come through Egypt and kill all the firstborn males and the firstborn livestock. But God gave his people a way out. And that was to sacrifice a lamb that God said had to meet these specific requirements and spread that blood on their doorposts. And then the angel of death would pass over them. And in Exodus 12, God says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. No foreigner shall eat of it. You shall not break any of its bones. No uncircumcised per person shall eat of it. It was only effective, the blood of the lamb was only effective for God's people. Only God's people benefited from the blood of the lamb and it was spread upon the houses of God's people and it covered them and saved them from God's wrath. And throughout the Pentateuch and especially in Exodus and Leviticus, we see the prescription for God's people and how they are to make themselves clean and do away with their sin. They had to offer sacrifices repeatedly they had sin offerings, guilt offerings, fellowship offerings, accidental sin offerings. My wife, uh, we're, we're reading, doing a Bible reading through the year together, and she pointed this accidental sin offering out to me in one of our daily readings. What that shows us is sin is not just deliberate rebellion to God, but it has everything to do with our motivations and our thoughts. How many times during the week, even on a daily basis, do you have thoughts that come into your head that you say, that is wrong, why did I think that? Accidental sin. It's not just the deliberate transgression of his law, it is our nature to sin. These sacrifices were a continual reminder that people are sinful and death is the price to be paid. Hebrews 9, 22 says, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. John Newton, the great hymn writer, 
He said, before the mercy of God can be dispensed to the offenders, the rights of God's justice and the demands of his law must be provided for. God cannot just sweep sin under the rug. His justice must be fulfilled. John Newton says the institution and continued use of sacrifices pointed out the necessity of an atonement. And an atonement means that there is a separation that needs to be overcome. It is a covering of a separation between two parties. And in our case, with sin, it's a separation to God because God is holy and he cannot stand sin. He will not be in the presence of it. That gap needs to be bridged. We need to be brought back together with God. But all of these animal sacrifices were pointing to something beyond themselves. Because we run into a problem. If humans are the culprits of sin, and if it's humans who have incurred the debt to God, shouldn't it be humans that pay the price? My church history professor, Dr. Nathan Parker, he when he he posed the question to the congregation this way. He said, how does a priest taking a knife to the throat of an animal remove human sin? And the answer is it doesn't. Hebrews 10.4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible. A man must pay for his own sin unless there's a substitute. But if a sinful man dies in the place of another sinful man, he is only dying for his own sin because the wages of sin is death. So the substitute cannot be a sinner. And no man can stand before the wrath of God. No man can stand before the judgment seat of God because all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Is there anyone worthy to die in the place of sinners? Is there anyone whose life is so perfect that maybe he can atone for someone else's sin? I was in Psalm 24 this morning by God's providence. David asked the question, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? The implicit answer is no one because David's response is only he that has clean hands and a pure heart, but all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Is there anyone worthy to step into the throne room of God and intercede for unworthy sinners to procure their forgiveness or to secure their salvation? The Bible gives us the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter five, Paul is reminding his people, his his church that he planted at Corinth, he's reminding them to live holy lives. Why? Because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. It is by the death of Christ that the wrath of God passes over his people. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. All of those sacrifices in the temple, all of the old covenant sacrifices were all pointing to something better because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. But Christ is our Passover lamb. It is his sacrifice that makes atonement. But how can this be? How can the death of Christ take away sin? Hebrews 10, verses three to 14, the author is speaking of all of the Old Testament sacrifices. He says, in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of, bull, uh, blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God, as it, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law, then he added, behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. How is it that Christ can offer himself as a once for all sacrifice? It's because of Christ and his perfection that his sacrifice was pleasing. 
and acceptable to God. It is because he is God that his sacrifice truly pays the price for man's sin because if he had even sinned one time, he would only be dying for his own sin. But because he never sinned, he can die in the place of someone else. And only God can withstand the wrath of God and rise from the dead. If Jesus had sinned one time, his death would have been for his own sin, but because he was perfect, spotless, and without blemish, he dies in the place of someone else. Now, some throughout church history have said that because Jesus is God, there's no way that he was actually human. He only appeared to be human, that Christ's divinity had overshadowed his humanity, but this is not what scripture tells us. He is fully God and fully man. He is fully God to intercede for us as our high priest to God the Father, and he's fully man to be man's representative in the sacrifice. He was made like us in every way, yet without sin. Hebrews 2 Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Propitiation is an appeasement of God's wrath. Verse 18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted. Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, for one, uh, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. What glory, what majesty from Jesus Christ that he's tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. His sacrifice is perfect. And so who satisfies God's wrath? God himself. Because Jesus is God. He's not just a perfect human. He is God incarnate, and it's he who willingly went to the cross and died for those whom the Father has given him. Now, this perfect sacrifice was foretold in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, listen to the language of lambs. He was despised and rejected by men. This is the chosen servant of God. This is who God sent to die. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet, verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. The Lord has put his servant to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Through the suffering of God's chosen servant, Jesus Christ, all who believe in him are healed of their iniquity because their iniquity has been placed upon the chosen servant, the Lamb of God. And believers in God have been brought back to God through the suffering of God's chosen servant. Listen to the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3. He said, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus, the righteous, suffered in the place of me and you, the unrighteous, unworthy, undeserving, Christ did it. He suffered once for sins. And there's nothing that we can do to make up our sin debt to God, but Jesus suffered in our place. And believers have been brought back to the Father through the sacrifice of his lamb. So what's the application? We always have to go to the application in this, right? It's observe, interpret, apply. That's what we do in our, in our class, right? There are two applications here. One, believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's your application. Believe in his work. It is finished. It is done. He said that in John chapter 20. It's finished. There's nothing you can do. Nothing I can do. Believe, trust, have faith in him. And the second one, and this is a product of that faith. Because of his sacrifice, you should live as though you've been truly forgiven. Live as though you've been truly cleansed. 
of your sin. The evidence of faith is love for Christ, love for his church, and obedience to his commands. That is evidence of his faith. John chapter 15, and house church, gosh, we did this like six weeks in a row. Jesus repeats himself, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love for Christ will produce obedience in our lives. Some may say that this is legalism because Christ fulfilled the law. There's no reason for me to have to follow the law. That was Old Testament stuff. I just have to love God and love neighbor. Well, how do you love God? You have no other gods before him. You make no idols. You don't take his name in vain. You rest with him. Oh wait, that's the first four commandments. How do you love your neighbor? You honor your father and mother. You don't murder. You don't lie. You don't steal from them. You don't cheat with their wives. That's the second half of the table of the law. So in order to truly love Christ, I've got to know what his law is. There's a, uh, a movement that has been afoot for the last 2,000 years um, called antinomianism. Big word that just means against the law. And what that means is people will say, because Christ fulfilled the law, there's no reason for me to have to obey the law. But that is not what scripture teaches. We are to imitate our creator in his holiness. Both Old and New Testament, God says, because I am holy, you be holy. Now, what does that mean in terms of our salvation? It means that we are covered in Christ's righteousness, and so when God looks upon us, he sees the perfection of his son. So we are holy in that respect, that we are covered in the righteousness of Christ. But also, holiness is something that is earned. Now, Christ earned it on our behalf, but we need to imitate him in his holiness. We imitate people all the time. We imitate those whom we love. We imitate those whom we adore. We imitate those whom we worship. Now in the culture, love, adoration, and worship means something completely different than it does to Christians. But we imitate those whom we love, or those who we spend time with, or those who pour into us. My son, 17 months old, not even a year and a half, he grunts when he sits down and gets up. Why? Because daddy does that. <laughs> Look, I played football for 10 years. I was in the Marines, okay, the knees hurt. But Sammy imitates me in the simple things of getting, sitting down and getting up. Who are we spending time with? Who are we imitating? What are we watching on social media? I saw this post, I was telling Hannah about it last night. I saw this post of this photographer who was on Instagram, who was narrating her recent photo shoot. And if you've ever been on Instagram and seen the reels, you know that every single influencer all talks the same way when they're running you through their day, right? So this is a day in the life of me as a mother of two. I make breakfast, I like that is how they do it. She did the same exact thing with the same voice inflection, with the same pauses, with the same starts, with the same everything that everybody else on Instagram does. Why? because she wants to be them. She's imitating those whom she sees as successful. Who are we to imitate? Jesus Christ, in his holiness, in his perfection, in his obedience to the commands of the Father. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Who are our leaders? What would our kids say if we said, um, do you want to imitate your mother and father? What do you see your mother and father doing? Like, hopefully, years from now, when I ask Sammy this question, hopefully he say, man, you really love mom well. That's what I want. Or you spent time in the word, I want that as well. You spent time in prayer, I want that as well. What would our kids say if we asked them who they're imitating? First Peter 1, he says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, 
not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The encouragement from Peter is you've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. Live like it. Live like it. First Peter chapter two. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Christ has borne our sin in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's the picture of baptism. That is dying to my old ways and rising in newness of life, having repented from my sins. How often when we repent and we turn from our sin and we turn towards God, how often in our Christian life do we walk like this? Looking back at our old sin, wanting that but yet we're moving in the direction of God. Eyes on God. Eyes on God. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Because our sin has been atoned for in the body of the Lamb of God, we have died to our old selves, and we are to live in righteousness. And we have been brought back to the shepherd of our souls by the death of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins, the appeasement of God's wrath for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. The death of Christ in our place is an appeasement of God's wrath against sin and sinners. The sacrifice is once for all, never to be repeated. Because of the worth of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice completely covers and pays for the sin of all believers for all time in all places because of his death and his worth. He is worthy to be praised. And because we're doing this series where we want you to be able to share your faith, we're gonna be hitting the gospel a lot and here's the gospel. My friend Billy says good news without bad news is just news. So the good news of God starts with the bad news. The bad news is that all are rightly and justly condemned under the law of God. So what's the good news then? Am I without hope in this world? Believers were ransomed, bought, and purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover lamb who is the Lamb of God. And through his substitutionary death on the cross in our place, we have been cleansed and forgiven of our sin debt that we owed to God. The second person of the Godhead, the incarnate word, took on human flesh. He lived a perfect life of perfect obedience to the perfect father, and he took the weight of our sins on his shoulders on a Roman cross, and he died there In their place, he was buried and he rose to life on the third day and ascended to the right hand of the Father, having accomplished and completed the very mission he was sent on, which was to seek and save the lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. And what is the effect of the gospel? Because he has been made an atonement for sin, we are now encouraged and admonished to live holy lives in brotherly love. You be holy, for he is holy. Imitate, imitate your perfect Savior. You pray with me. Father, you are good. Your word is true, and we thank you for it, that in it we can see the truth of who you are, your character, your holiness, your worthiness to be praised, your justice, your wrath, against all things that are unrighteous. And we also thank you that you do not leave us hopeless and helpless. You have provided your son to be the very sacrifice that cleanses unworthy sinners and brings them back to yourself. And now when you look upon those who trust in the blood of Jesus, you see his perfection and his righteousness covering them. By your spirit, will you urge us and push us and encourage us on into holiness that we may love one another with a brotherly love, with a holy love, and that we may always revere your son with due reverence and due honor for his perfection, for for his role as the second person of the Godhead, for his sacrifice on the cross.
that we never grow weary or ungrateful. We thank you for who you are, and I pray we don't leave this here. I pray we take this with us into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.